Good morning, Laura. Good morning. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. <laughs> yes. Okay. Right on the first try. <laughs> um, I will pass off host controls to you in a couple minutes. Um, and Jeremiah, another committee member, is in here too, just to make sure everything works. Okay, great. Thank you. Yes. Look good, Adrian. Look at you. How's your internet? Uh oh. Are you able to hear me, Kayla? Yes, Adrian, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. <laughs> I was nervous for a second. I was like, uh-oh, here we go. No, I can hear you. Yeah, it's like All the right. devil is busy this morning, man. Like. Am I still frozen? No, you're fine. I think it was just a, you know, Mars break. <laughs> great thing going on. We're fine. Hi, everyone. I'm Laura Miller. I'm the moderator, and I'm going to screen share um, our guidelines for Q&A questions again, just so everyone can take a look at them before we start. Um, we'll give everyone a couple more minutes to roll in.
If you're just joining us, good morning, welcome. Um, I'm Laura, I will mo be moderating this session and uh, I've posted our, uh, our approach to Q&A here. And let's give people, I think, two more minutes to roll in um, and then we'll get started. little dark bit. All right, um, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone, um, or good morning in Arizona. Good afternoon to everyone else on the East Coast. Um, I'm Laura Miller, I'll be moderating this session and you are at the Unheard Call, Reconstructing Support to Doctoral Students Through a Critical Lens, um, presented by Adrian Hobdy and uh, Amanda Leftwich of Montgomery County Community College. Um, and we're so happy you're here and presenting for us today. Um, I just wanna remind people that this presentation it will be recorded, just the beginning presentation portion, and then when we go into discussion, we'll turn that off. Um, and a few uh, cla uh, class attendees have been interested in saving the chat and posting it publicly. Um, that's something we're not gonna be doing, but if you're interested in saving the chat for your own notes, uh, every uh, attendee can do that on their own. So go ahead and do that. Um, if you want to chat about this presentation, please head on over to Twitter and use the hashtag CLAPS2020. That's C-L-A-P-S 2020 um, to connect and chat. And we also have the chat box, of course, below to chat. Um, and I'll monitor the chat um, and save questions um, and we can, we can work through that as well. So just want to remind everyone that we have about a week more presentations that we're really excited about. So you can head on over to our website, which I will post in the chat as well um to to register for any sessions so all sessions include a one hour live zoom discussion everything has its own registration link and everything is in that very confusing arizona mountain standard time we don't participate in daylight savings i wish we did <laughs> it'd be a lot easier for for all of our other colleagues and then our closing keynote will be on friday september 17th um, at one o'clock and we have Dr. Nolan Cabrera there, the author of White Guys on Campus. And we're really excited to welcome him um, and have him close out our conference. Um, so with that, I'm going to, uh, Amanda and Adrian, I'm gonna make you the co-hosts and you can screen share and, and take it from here. Great, hey, thank you. I will share on my screen. Okay, Adrian. Can everyone see the slide, the first slide?
Laura, can you see the slides? Yes, I can see the slides. And you know, okay. now that I have passed control off to you, Amanda, I can't make Adrian a co-host, but you can do that. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry about that. I don't, I don't think she's using this, just um, I'm controlling the slides, so we're good. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, take it away. All right, thank you so much. <clears throat> So hello everyone, um, this is the Unheard Call, Reconstructing Support to Doctoral Students Through a Critical Lens. And my name is Amanda Marie Leftwich. I am um, a librarian. I am the Student Success Librarian at Monco. Um, and yeah, there's a lot to go on here, but I just wanna say, Welcome. I'm glad you're all here. You may know me from Mindful NLIS or Live Voices. You can follow those pages. But today we're talking about um, supporting doctoral students. And I'll let Adrian take it away. So I am Adrian Hobby. I am the Director of Talent Management and Leadership Development at Monco, a Montgomery County Community College. And I technically work in the Human Resources Office. So I am a part of the business unit at the college. And we're going to say Monco a lot. Um, so it's Montgomery County Community College. We might say Monco, MC3, or MCCC. Just bear with us. It's a lot to say. <laughs> Adrian, that's you. Awesome. So in 2016, um, our college, Montgomery County Community College, was interested in developing uh, what we call an HR employee resource group. And we wanted to do that to support our workforce development, engagement and retention efforts. Um, and so employee resource groups have been around since the 1960s. It's not a new concept in HR. Um, it was primarily formed to support black and brown workers as they were working in predominantly white workplaces so that they could sort of discuss race-based issues, their experiences, and kind of develop solutions to support one another. Um, conceptually, ERGs haven't changed much over time, um, but we are seeing an increase in use of them at, um, in, in businesses and in higher ed simply because of the current climate. Um, they are voluntary, it's a voluntary group, they are employee-led, um, and usually there's some common interest that unites the group. We wanted to form several groups at Monco primarily to improve, um, improve our retention efforts, like I said before, and improve, improve our engagement efforts. Um, we thought that one particular issue that we wanted to tackle was supporting our tuition reimbursement program and tuition readmission program. Um, currently, about 30% of our population actually takes advantage of that benefit. And we reimburse 75 to 100% of a doctoral program uh, to support our employees. But what we found is only about 20% of employees were actually completing their program. And so we surveyed our faculty and staff to figure out what type of ERGs they would be interested in and if they would be interested in forming a group to specifically support them in completing their doctoral studies. And so um, it was a resounding yes. Uh, the groups said specifically their concerns were that they were not as engaged with their home institutions and they felt like there was a lack of support uh, from their home institutions specifically for either their research topics or um, an understanding of what the doctoral process was. I personally did not experience that, but that was what, that was the feedback that we received. Uh, later, we realized that these feelings and experiences were compounded because of unique circumstances of our employees. Um, most of them were first generation graduate students. Um, many of them were minority and women who were balancing work and children, home, family responsibilities. And so, there was a disconnect between them and the home institution. And then the third unique factor was a lot of them had an interest in researching the community, co community college experience and population. Um, and so because of that, they often said that they, they just wanted to be able and be around people who supported their interests and who could provide one-on-one -on -one guidance um, to them. 
as a result sort of of the feedback that we received, we developed an, an ERG is what we call an employee resource group. And we partnered with libraries and institutional research to help facilitate sessions and workshops about research, publishing, understanding how the IRB process, um, understanding the research process, the um, defense process and things like that. And that's sort of the background of the, of the project. That's great. So um, Adrian came to me and then I worked with another librarian, uh, Mary Beth Parkinson, who could not be here um, and doesn't really like presenting. So we took the charge on this. Um, but I just wanted to give her a shout out because she did help me with the beginning of the foundation of this. So really, I want to just talk about the connections, right? The connections that I saw how the libraries could really support Adrian's program, um, because it is Adrian's program and we really wanted to make it um, as great as she is because Adrian gives a lot of support to other people and I felt like she wasn't getting as much support as she could have from the library. So I really wanted to um, make a better connection. Right. So my first point, um, Jennifer Ferretti's powerful article, Building a Critical Culture, How Critical librarian Librarianship Falls Short in the Workplace, um, was published this year and asked libraries to move past performance. Right. So she asked an important question, which I sort of used to frame my work in this article. Um, it says, are we treating our colleagues with the same critical care as we strive to support our students and patrons? And I would say that the libraries were trying at that point, but we weren't doing as much as we could have done because we didn't know about the um, faculty and staff going to these other institutions and not receiving this, the support. And really we should have known because everyone can use library resources. It's not just the students and not just the patrons, right? But our focus was really on the students. And because we are a community college, you know, we thought, well, we don't really have anything to offer anyone doing a doctoral program, but that's not true. Um, so, and again, like, you know, as community college educators and leaders, we're told to focus on teaching. Um, however, it, it comes at a cost for your researchers who are continuing their education, right? Um, when, we, when we say that we're only focusing on teachers or teaching faculty, um, we're excluding people. And, and we were excluding the staff, if you really think about it that way, which was not what we were trying to do at all. It was just a very big gap that Adrian said, well, what can you do for us and how can you help us? And I, we, we, you know, we kind of looked at each other like, you want our help, <laughs> you know? But it, it came to the point where we had to realize like this was something we could do. So I want you to reflect on your own graduate students. Are you supporting them um, as much as you could and, or are you contributing to performance? So my point to you, um, the, college, the college's mission is to foster research for employees. So the key word there is everyone, employees, meaning everyone. Therefore, the libraries needed to reach out and see, see what everyone needed at all levels, which I mentioned before. And then the third point, which I, it's, it's a very like heartbreaking point to me. Um, according to Barbara, Barbara Lovitz um, in her book, Leaving the Ivory Tower, 50% of PhD candidates leave without a degree. The reason noted for leaving was a lack of support from their programs, both, both academically and emotionally. Um, and it was also found that this lack of support or loneliness slash isolation leads them to drop out. So these are, these are just the facts. This is what it is. Um, and I haven't gone through the doctoral process, um, and I knew that I didn't want my colleagues, especially my, my black and brown colleagues, to feel isolated when the libraries had an opportunity to support them. So um, Adrian and I recently agreed that this is what we were doing. We were kind of like, oh, yeah, hey, this is like our framework, right? So we um, are focusing our work and our efforts on relational cultural theory, right? So it plays a major work in what we do. And remember, research shows that doctoral students drop out from a, lot, a lack of care. Therefore, we need to think about the whole person. Um, are we considering the whole person in what we're doing? If we weren't, then we needed a change. Adrian and I also noticed that we were supporting more by POC and women scholars than anyone else, right? So that meant that we really had to buckle down and really see what they needed. 
um, and really think about unique ways to support people. And I'm, I promise we're going to get there. So community college stigma. Um, I wanted to bring this up because I think that this is a big deal in why our students weren't supported as much as they were. Um, there is a stigma attached to attending a community college. We believe that that stigma also extended to our faculty and staff in graduate programs. Um, for example, um, an MC3 faculty member shared that a fellow student asked them what institution they worked for and the, the person replied MC3 and then that person replied back, oh, only a community college. No wonder you have so much time on your hands. This is from someone who is in the doctoral program um, who works at Monco. This was the response that they received, okay? Um, I just wanna make it very clear. This is elitist nonsense. <laughs> um, we community college educators, leaders, employees, we work just as hard as an R1, maybe even harder because we have less resources. Also, the fact that you may not see us doesn't mean that we're not doing the work, but our work is usually more internal and our tenure is usually more focused internal. So you may not see community college educators, leaders, librarians out there in the field because they're doing a lot of work um, internally. But that doesn't mean that we're not doing work that's important to the field, right? And I just wanna also make clear, no one's path to education is better than the other. We're all here, we're all trying, we're all trying to benefit um, the idea of the mission of our institutions, which is to support our students, right? Um, also, on another note, you won't really hear about any fraudulent scandals for coming from community colleges. Um, we are not perfect, but um, we won't let ignorance stop us from supporting those that need assistance. Also, CritLib has been a bit exclusionary. Um, most researchers in this area of expertise are from R1 and R2s. Ask yourself, where are all the community college leaders and educators? Why are they not in the spaces? Um, have they not been invited? And what barriers are in place for CC educators and researchers um, to stop them from contributing to the field? So we're gonna talk a bit about successes and challenges and Adrian and I will go back and forth here. So we created a toolkit and I thought that it should be up on the, wherever the information is that you got for this um, workshop. Uh, but the toolkit was to help students figure out how they could save all their resources, what they needed to study, um, who they should contact, and compare their resources that they had at their own um, school institutions and ours. In some cases, we had things that the other institution did not, and how could you get in contact with your own librarian, and we were trying to make those connections to show that, yes, we do have a good amount of resources, but also you should double check with your librarian at your institution because we think sometimes um, because we were dealing with a lot of first gen students who are who are now educators at MC3 that they were a bit confused about what they could do what they couldn't do who they could um, contact. Um, so that's supported with research and evaluative goals um, and Adrian. You, yeah. you are muted. Oh. Um, there you go. Okay, I think I clicked it too many times. My apologies. Um, we we a part of the the toolkit was also um, uh, uh, providing like sort of a guidebook for understanding the process of of writing and research, and then once you actually have earned and your degree has been conferred, what is the publishing process? What does that look like? How do you take your dissertation? and turn it into a journal article. Um, how do you sort of succeed in that area? That's something that is very foreign and was very foreign to a lot of our employees simply because of either their background or just lack of experience um, in higher ed um, to some degree. And so we, especially for our administrators, so we have three groups of category, three uh, categories of employees. We have administrators, our faculty, and our staff. Um, and it's about equal how many of our faculty and staff, faculty and administrators actually pursue doctoral degrees. On the administrator side, they are very interested in researching student patterns at a community college, student behaviors at a community college. 
how they engage in our programs, how they engage in the work that we do, and how they persist. So they're very interested in looking at those topics. And so what we wanted to do was to provide um, information on various frameworks that could be replicated at a, a two-year institution for their research and for their publishing later on. So that meant that we in HR had to work with our library department so that we could find out what were sort of these rarely used research methodologies um, out there that exist, rarely used um, articles, or how to decipher articles that you can actually extract information that's closely related and then replicate the study, um, even if it's not necessarily at a two-year school. So that's what the, the research toolkit allowed for our employees to do. Many of them found it to be very helpful um, because we also walked through the toolkit with them. And then we would also follow up with them periodically to see how they were using it. Um, and it helped them advocate for their research methodology at their home institution. Great. So helping them with their research, supporting, giving more support to BIPOC and women doctoral students, also creating goals and timelines. What do you hope to do after your dissertation? What do you hope to do um, postdoc, right? Because they were very confused about where you go next, right? They were so in the zone and in the process. And we had one-on-one -on -one meetings with a few people to figure out what to do next. Now, I just want to uh, make clear the doctoral network, this is people who are in the, who are about to start the program, in their programs, and then afterwards. So we were working with a myriad of people trying to figure out what exactly they need. And a lot of it was just one-on-one, -on -one, like a regular meeting and saying, what do you hope to do? What do you hope to learn? And how can the library support you do that? So a lot of it was um, helping people avoid predatory journals. Um, we did have an issue with a couple of our faculty and staff paying to um, submit their work. So we were trying, we had to nip that in the bud and really get them to understand the difference between a regular journal and a predatory journal. So, of course, we have some challenges <laughs> um, because there are different levels here, which I explained. Some of the students we met way too late in their process. While they loved the toolkit, they were like, I'm halfway done or I'm more than halfway done. But thank you, boo. Um, and it was they were very kind and very sweet. But, um, you know, we, we met them too late. So we were trying to figure out how we can meet them a bit sooner and work with them throughout their process. Right. Um, trying to get more students to participate in this or more faculty employee um, to participate in this. We had three that we definitely who are in doctoral programs now who we see consistently um, and who we have helped consistently. And one good thing that came from that, which I wanted to share here, is one of our students had trouble with um, getting, getting enough people to do a survey for their doctoral program. Um, so, you know, they asked me for help, like, could I reach out to my contacts and get more people for them to do it. So because the research focuses on African Americans in, and finance, I had sent the list out to BCALA listserv and the numbers jumped. So the first number amount or amount of people that they got was 14. After I sent it to the list, the person had 86 people respond. So it's little things like that that we can do that are not like they're not difficult. It wasn't really out of the box for me to send an email to BCALA and thank God for BCALA. Um, but it's things like this that we can do, right? Also, we're having some funding issues, right? Like it's it's easy for me to do a workshop, right? It's easy for me to present something. It's quite difficult for me to support. Um, the students the way that they probably need and deserve. So we're trying to figure out how we can get some more funding um, for, you know, just to maybe to host a conference day or to do something that really supports the doctoral needs. Um, so yeah, so the future of this, as I sort of hinted on, we want to build a lecture series right, and, um, and a conference series maybe that we host um, so that everyone can present. So usually how it works at our institution is that we have faculty development 
um, but staff development is a bit lacking. So what we're trying to do is to get faculty development to just host all events. So anyone who's doing a doctoral program can present in the faculty development series. And we, we've been sort of successful. We're getting that off the ground right now. Um, so hopefully that'll come soon. And it'll be open to everyone, anyone can come. We want to focus more specialized workshops. So, you know, publishing, um, you, you know, you got your doc, now what type of thing? Like, what, what is the next step? What are the next goals? What are the next timelines for everyone based on their individual needs? Um, and the last thing, we really want a repository for scholarly works that is for the faculty and staff, and it's also for the students. Um, we do have researchers, we have educators, we have so, such good um, information coming out, but we have no place to store it. So that, that becomes an issue, and we want to make sure that we're amplifying the work of our scholars. Because a lot of people are just putting stuff in their OneDrive, and that is not helpful. <laughs> So I just have some questions for you to reflect on um, because I love reflection. So are you really connecting with your uh, graduate students, doctoral students? Uh, what collaborative initiatives can you use to create those goals? So for example, Adrian and I have worked well together these last, what, almost two years now, goodness. So what else can you do? What other department can you work with to support your doctoral students? What barriers are in place to this happening? Do you have enough staff to do this? Do you have enough uh, resources? All of these things, finances, you might wanna think about that. And how are you assessing your goals? So if you don't know how you can assess your goals for this, it may not be worth it to do it. For us, it's the success that they complete the program and that they have the support that they need. Um, so for us, that's a big goal, especially since the college puts so much money out for them to finish. I mean, for faculty, we get 100% covered, right? So that's a lot of money to go out. We have to make sure that they are finishing and that they're supported. I would just add to there, one of the other goals of this, um, which we're starting to realize now this fall, is to share your research across the institution, especially the research that you've done um, at the college that with our population. Um, we want to hear what impact, what you found, what your research discovered, what you uncovered. So being able to have the faculty lecture series or have the dissertation uh, lecture series is really important to us because it's a way to give back to the community. And it's a way for us to internally um, assess our operations and assess things that we're doing. Um, and it's mutually beneficial for our students, for our staff, and for the institution. Exactly. Does anyone have any questions for us? Yes, feel free to post your questions in the chat um, and we already have a few coming in. Predatory lending, um, I can tell you a little bit of background about the conversation. We had, like Amanda mentioned, we had several employees who were really interested in um, publishing their research. And so occasionally employees will get an email saying, we'd like you to contribute a book chapter or we'd like you to write an article for such journal, it's only $500. And our employees, especially on the administrator side, weren't as aware that you don't have to do that. That's not a part of the normal process of publishing in journals. And when we um, got wind that that was some actually occurring, um, I approached the libraries and said, hey, what can we do? What can we do to inform our employees about what the, the actual process should look like, feel look like, feel like, could look like. Um, and so Amanda developed a, a session that we held about identifying a legitimate opportunity when it comes to publishing. So I don't know if you want to talk about that, Amanda. Yeah, so the first session that we did, we, um, 
my colleague and I were like on the fence about what we could actually do or what we should do. So we didn't really focus as much on publishing. We were focusing more on the research side. So we did talk about predatory journals, what you should do, the BOs list, all that thing. And that was new information to them, um, which really surprised me because I thought that they, at that level, um, they would know that, but they, they didn't. And that's why we were there to help them learn more about it. So, you know, we really, tried to make sure that they, we were very clear that you do not need to pay to be in a journal. You do not need to pay to be in a book chapter. Like, they, like it, we just had to nip that in the bud because we had a lot of people lose a lot of money um, doing these things. And it was, it, it was just disappointing. Um, I will say we had students um, at institutions um, Locally, we're in the greater Philadelphia area, so we had all of the, the, the major public institutions, the private institutions. We did have some students who were in online programs. Uh, we also had students, and a lot of our students, they were at traditional institutions. Um, but because of the demands on, as we talked about earlier, the demands on their schedule, their time, their experiences, they didn't always necessarily even know how to engage. Uh, with their host home institution. It was sort of go to class, meet with your advisors, work within your, and a lot of the programs, the doctoral programs are cohort-based programs. Mm. Uh, and so they would meet with their cohorts and things. So they didn't necessarily in, engage as an undergrad would, or even a master's level student would with the services offered on campus. Um, in regards to the discipline, that one actually is, was a challenge. Um, and there were times where we separated the disciplines. So those who were in the STEM disciplines, we separated them from the sort of education. We have a lot of um, individuals who were going back for EDDs and PhDs in education. Um, and so we would separate them because their methodology at times was very different. And so we would have conversations about the types of research in um, journals and um, searches that they could conduct to find out what they needed to do to um, develop their research methodology. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they didn't come to us in groups. So that was a good thing. They came to us individually. So, you know, it was really a one-on-one -on -one process. So um, I worked a lot with someone who's doing their doctorate in um, finance, right? And then I think my colleague worked with someone who was in nursing. So we weren't, we weren't like, having that too much of a difficulty from that, from that standpoint when they came to us, I think it was harder for Adrian. Um, and someone asked, uh, hello, Naomi, um, if we use LibGuides to build a community, we did, we have an eternal um, LibGuide for the doctoral students. Um, it, did, it does get quite a bit of use. We're gonna update it. I, I didn't wanna share it because it's still a little bit. Uh, um, so we're working on that, but yep, we do have a LibGuide for it. To to find the students, we initially did a call out to the entire college um, and, and just invited people to an, uh, sort of an interest meeting to see if they were, once we collected the data and the research, we shared with them what we found and we talked about our vision for the group, but that we were open to this, them kind of taking ownership of the group and what it could potentially look like. So it was sort of an interest meeting initially, but it was an open call via email, and we just invited them to come. And at that, the very first meeting, we had over 40 people show up. And someone asked about a brown bag series lunch. Um, we just, well, at Monco, I don't know about how every other institution works, but when we have like all college meetings, there's always food. <laughs> there's always a nice food that Adrian provides for us. So we didn't have to worry about that. It was just like a regular presentation and we just gave it and they got to eat and then we ate afterwards and, and we got to really um, talk to people one-on-one -on -one about their research. And it was, I think it was a good session. I think whatever you want to make the session, make it your own and how it works for your employees. You know, we know how it works for Monco. We're just giving you suggestions on what you can do at your institution. Um, this is an aside. What I will say is when I was going through my um, doctoral journey, the institution where I was, they had a program where um, doctoral students 
uh, it, was only, it only happened once, doctoral students had a luncheon with uh, current administrators and faculty and staff. Um, and we got an opportunity to, and they, they organized it by um, tables, sort of round tables. And they allowed us to talk about our research interests to see if there were any uh, people we could potentially partner with um, looking for advisors, looking for a dissertation chair, things like that. That was really helpful. Um, it was very helpful to see what the interests were at the institution, um, but also to meet some of the faculty, staff, and administrators and find out what their research projects, what their ongoing research projects were. So um, that's another way you can do it if you, you have a, a doctoral program on your campus. Mm -hmm. In um, Africa, we have not considered a grant, but we probably should <laughs> at this point because we're getting more um, interest in the program. So, I, Adrian, I guess we should look into that a little bit more. We were hoping that the institution would pay for it because it's an it, it's really institutional um, development, right? Professional development. So that's what we're going to lean into a bit more. So we'll see we'll see what happens um, between funding from the college and possibly a grant. Yasmin and Jean, thank you both for those suggestions. I like the librarians for lunch idea. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think we will add the um, personal statement and pedagogical statement yes. to our agenda. Thank you. This is any support ideas for open, open access publishing. That does cost getting waivers guidelines. No, I think at this point, we're trying to get them not to, I, I think the first big hurdle was getting them not to pay for things. The, the second hurdle was working with the people, working with them earlier, because we noticed that that was a problem. So I think that the next workshop will focus on, you know, open access and all of those things later on. Those will be the, the workshops that we do. Um, I think anytime you can publish anywhere that's reputable, you should go for it. And if you feel like that's something that you want to do. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to see what this cohort does because we have a big, we had a big group that just graduated. So I think this will be the, like this will be the big test group to see what they do, how well it goes um, and what more support we need to give them. Do we have a sense of whether I, I didn't well I know from them telling me that most of them are first gen. I don't have the numbers. Adrian, do you? No, that is what we're planning to do this year. Um, since we are working remotely, um, is to sort of find out more information about who is actively involved, um, the demographics, like really identifying who participates and understanding their why a little bit more because that will help us develop programming as well and other ways to support. Oh, Jean, the, oh, the OI publishing funds. Um, I mean, you know how funding is in libraries, right? Like they, they never, you know, they rather take money from us than give us anything. So I think you have to, to not, we're not saying prove your worth, but prove the value of supporting your students. If, especially if if the college is paying for the for any of the employees to go to these institutions, right? Um, there should be something that they give back. There, it, it just it has to work that way. Um, and I think a lot of the a lot of our doctoral students want to provide um, that information back. So that's why we're saying we want a repository so that we can really say that we support scholars at this college. And if they're not willing to give us the funding, then we're going to have to go to um, get to, to get a grant, which is probably what we're going to have to do. Um, but I think, you know, stand your ground and say, this is what I need. And if they won't give it to you another way, work with another department to see if maybe they have the funding that you could possibly get. Or maybe you could, you know, grants, they're always difficult, but I think you just got to go for it. I mean, because Adrian just started this because she knew that there was a need. She asked me to join because she knew that we could help. I mean, really, the first thing is just to go for it. Like we didn't, I think at MC3, we have a thing like, you know, we'll ask for forgiveness later. We just do the thing. <laughs> and there is like a, a sort of a quiet um, understanding that 
if you want to try something, you go for it. And if it works out well, we'll give you funding for it. So that's what we're really trying to prove is that this is working well. Now we need the funding. So maybe your institutions are like that as well. I think it depends on where you are. Oh, thank you, Jill. That's helpful. Yep, Samantha, mm -hmm, federal funding, yep. We are not a, a part of any consortium. We are our own baby. We, I don't think, I, I mean, even when we tried to join, we tried to join a, a library consortium and the college was like, no, it's not happening. We are our own um, institution and we are, we are three institutions in one. So we have a culinary campus. We have a campus that's in Pottstown, which is like the middle of nowhere kind of Pennsylvania. And then we have the campus um, in Bluebell where Adrian and I work. So there is no consortium option for us, unfortunately. We would love to do it. We, you know, we always try to work with other institutions if we can. Um, Adrian and I both work with uh, people who work in different institutions all the time as individuals for our own research. Um, but at, at a college level, no. Unfortunately. But if you, if anybody wants to work with us, we are happy <laughs> to accept. <laughs> This was supposed to be a round table, so we wanted to leave a lot of time for questions. So if you still have questions or any comments or anything that you, any other great suggestions like you've been giving us, this will be helpful. Sure. So I, I didn't get them to respond. BCALA is a boss and I just put it in the listserv. I put it, uh, Sue, I put it in the listserv and I said, could you help one of our students um, on their doctoral research? And I sent the link, the Qualtrics link in the listserv and it, you know, they were, people responded. I mean, that's, that's all, you know, community.